Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. Let me look into this camera right here and welcome everyone joining us in our outdoor courtyard, our online campus, and Discovery Northwest launching today. Come on, are you excited to be in God's house wherever you're at? Man, we're so excited. Man, about what God's going to do at Northwest and God continues to move. Welcome to Easter at Discovery. I have a, a message titled today, um, Ruins to Resurrection. And if you've ever like, had a situation in your life or a time in your life, a season of your life where you felt like, man, it's ruined. Like it's, I've made a mess of it. It's ruined. I'm ruined. It's broken. It's a mess. This is really the Easter message. It's, it's, it's from the ruins to resurrection. See, when you think about the Easter like holiday that we celebrate, there's really two separate components, different, very different components that we celebrate. And the first is the Friday component. That's where we celebrate the cross. And then there's the Sunday component where we celebrate the resurrection. Here's, here's what I think, you guys. I think that a lot of people can identify with the Friday part, but I don't think people really fully understand what the Sunday part was all about. So Friday, of course, was the most well-known, one of the most well-known days in all of history where, where Jesus was hung on the cross. So if I, can, if I can just explain a little bit of the power and the importance of Friday before I go ahead and, and, and share and preach about the Sunday. Because to those who are watching the crucifixion, it looked like and appeared that evil had won and Jesus had lost and was defeated and made a public spectacle. The charges that were against Jesus, they were written on this piece of wood and nailed over his head on the cross. His life was taken from him. And, and it looked like the kingdom he came to advance had been thwarted. It appeared like that, but appearances are dece deceiving, aren't they? Because it was actually the opposite thing that was happening. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 says that Jesus, having canceled the charge of our legal, key phrase, legal indebtedness. The Bible calls that transgression, that in the kingdom of heaven, we had a legal indebtedness that, that was actually a charge against us and condemned us, he says. Jesus has taken it away, look where it's at now, nailing it to the cross. See, the cross was a demonstration of love and of sacrifice, but it was more than just a demonstration, it was a legal transaction where Jesus himself canceled the charges and the record against us. See, from the human eyes, Jesus' death was defeat, but the reality was it was Jesus who was defeating the evil principalities and authorities. Jesus appeared to be experiencing public humiliation, but in reality, it was the powers and authorities that were being humiliated. The, the human charges against Jesus were nailed above his cross, but the reality was it was my charges that were nailed to the cross by Jesus. See, on that Friday, Jesus took on himself our penalty and our sin, which has to be paid for, by the way. Let me say it to you this way. We've all committed sin, and the price tag for the legal transgression that we occurred is the death penalty. Someone's going to die. So what Jesus decided to do is to step into the courtroom of your life and pay your fine and pay your bill. Like, you don't have to pay for it anymore. It's been paid for. In fact, it would be ridiculous for you to pay a bill that's already been paid for. Like, you don't, you don't have to. But the, the reality is, like some of us, we, we check this out, we don't have to join a church to get in on that transaction. And Jesus, all he asks is this, Jesus says, I gave my life fully for you. And what I want is for you to give your life fully back to me. He's not looking for any religious rules. He's not looking for your performance. He's not looking for or waiting for you to fix things in advance. Now, if you've never had the reality of that Friday experience the Friday part of Easter, I hope you leave here today with what Jesus accomplished on the cross applied to your life. But here's the thought that I had this Easter, and that is, if Friday was so complete, and if Friday was so powerful, and if Friday took care of everything, canceled the record and the charges against us, and if Friday took care of everything for me to actually have a relationship with God, then why does there even need to be a Sunday? Like, why didn't Jesus just stay in the grave then? 
Or why didn't he just disappear from the grave and just up here in heaven? Let me ask it like this. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? This is where the challenge is for so many people, where the tension lies because we can kind of relate to and connect to the, th the Friday part. I can connect to the pain, to the suffering, to the trials, to what he did. He canceled some things. He forgave me. He took it on. I can connect to that. But so many people can't really connect to Jesus rising from the dead. It's like, how do I relate to that? How do I relate to Jesus getting up out of the grave? There are a few reasons why Jesus actually did. He rose from the grave. And I want to drill down on one of the primary, the most important reason he did rise from the grave. But there are a few of them. Let me give them to you. The first one is this. Write this down. The first reason why he rose from the grave was to prove that he is who he said and claimed to be. It's one thing to make the claim. It's another thing to back that claim up, right? He's not dead. He's alive. No other God has ever done that. No other God has even made the claim of doing that. That's what makes our God different. Honestly, that's what makes our God God. Amen, somebody? He's alive. He's not dead. To which the skeptics say, well, of course you believe that. That's your myth. That's your Christian fable. That's what you guys, you guys, you guys believe that. But here's the reality. There are an extra biblical, not in the Bible, other historical documented texts, 400 other people who actually witness Jesus Christ after he was crucified and buried, walking around and talking to people. Okay? This is a historical reality. It's recorded in the Bible in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. It says, after his sufferings, he presented himself to a lot of people and gave many convincing proofs that he is alive. But check it out. That's the outcome of Easter. He's risen. The question today is, what's the reason? What is the reason why Jesus rose from the grave because there is another reality that, that for many of you who have had this Friday experience with Jesus, like he's paid your debt, there's another reality of why he rose from the grave. Write it down like this. It was to conquer death, not just for himself, but to conquer death for you, okay? My fear is that you would come into church and you would just celebrate the historical reality of Jesus rising from the grave, and that's great. We should, we should celebrate that. But there's more to Easter than the historical reality. Easter exists to provide something for you. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Jesus says this. I am he who lives and was dead. I love that. All other gods are dead. Our God was dead. Amen, somebody? And behold, I am alive forevermore. And then Jesus amens himself. I love it. He's all, amen. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's like, that was good. I don't know if it, I feel like that sometimes. You guys don't amen me and stuff. And I'm like, I don't care. Amen, Pastor Jason. That was good. Sometimes I just got to do that for myself. I love what Jesus. And then he says that this is hilarious. I read the Bible very, I don't know, different than maybe some of you. There's a lot of humor in the Bible. Look at this next line, what Jesus says. And I have the keys to hell. You guys, the devil is so defeated. He don't even have the keys to his own house. Come on, somebody. <laughs> The Bible says between, between Friday and Sunday that Jesus went and took the keys of Hades and of death. And that is more than funny. That is a reality that you and I need to understand because check this out. Keys unlock things. Keys hold the secret to some things. And basically Jesus is saying, I was resurrected so that I could possess the power to unlock death for everyone, write down the reason Jesus rose from the grave. We're going to drill down on this. To provide resurrection power. Somebody say resurrection power. Come on. The, look, it's, it's, this is what Sunday is all about. The cross was a demonstration of love. But the resurrection was a demonstration of power. But it was more than just demonstrative, right? Remember, it was a legal transaction that was happening in the kingdom of heaven. The cross was the legal transaction of your record and charges being expunged and erased, okay? But the resurrection was the legal transaction that gave you keys and authority to power in this life and in the next. I mean, that's so important because a lot of people have had the Friday kind of experience. Like you're going to heaven because you believe in Jesus, but you're still walking around in destruction and defeat. 
And it's because you celebrate the resurrection, but you don't have resurrection power. And that's why God doesn't just want you to get saved. He doesn't just want you to be like a member of a church. He doesn't just want you to believe all throughout the Bible. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, the apostle Paul said it like this. I want to know Christ. That's the Friday part. I want to know him and experience the power of his resurrection. I want to experience both of these things. So, so I got a few simple questions for you today. The first is this. Do you know Christ? Have you had that Friday experience? And if you ha haven't had that, it's, it's done in a moment of belief, in a simple moment of surrender. You can know Christ and have your sins forgiven and canceled and have the reality of that good Friday experience. And if you've never had that, Friday experience where your sins are forgiven. I'm going to give you an opportunity later in the service. But for a lot of you, you've maybe had that experience. So the real question that applies honestly to every single one of us, no matter where you're at in your faith journey, the question I want to talk about is, do you also know the power of his resurrection? So in other words, after you decided to follow Jesus, did you allow resurrection power to confront every area that is dead and dying in your life? See, the, the inspiration for this message today came a while back within the course of just a few days. I talked to a few different people, and the first person that came to me and needed some help, they said this. They said, Pastor, I feel like my life is ruined. It's ruined. And they began to explain the mess that they made, and they even explained the history of what they've experienced and how it's just been one thing after another. It's, it's ruined. And then just a few days later, I talked to this married couple and they said, Pastor, our marriage is ruined. And they begin to explain the dysfunction and, and the, the hurt that they caused each other and even some things in the past. And, 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 and I ministered to both these people on different occasions, but afterwards, what kept coming to the back of my mind was this word. It kept coming back to me, ruin, ruin. Ruin. So I looked it up in, in the dictionary, and, and the first definition that I found for this word ruin is something reduced to a state of decay, collapse, or disintegration. And that's where people feel like it's just done, it's over, it's gone, it's ruined. But there's another definition. The second definition is the disastrous disintegration, not of the things, but of someone's life. So many people believe that they can be forgiven, but they just don't believe they can get their life back. My, my life can never be great again, Pastor Jason, because I've already messed it up. I already made my moral choices. I've already done the thing, man. And I even have the scars. I got the scars in my soul from it. So even if I did get in on that Friday thing and I get my sins forgiven and stuff, I still have the scars. It's ruined. Even if I did get in on it, my marriage is ruined. And I've been through a few of them already. I've got this track record already. I can't go. Where do I go from here? It's ruined. Some of you students can maybe sympathize with this. You know, you're like, I tried to get good grades, and I got that F, and it's on the transcript, man. It's, on, it's ruined. There's only so many A's that you can get to lift that GPA now. You know what I mean? It's like, it's ruined. And here's the, here's, here's the reality. Part of the reality is, you're right, it is ruined, unless you possess resurrection power. That, uh, see, this, this resurrection power can take all the dead things and bring them back there to life. Only through Jesus can you go from ruins to resurrection, and I want you to believe that this Easter. And I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you all week. This prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle Paul wrote this prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, and I've been praying it over your life. Verses 19 and 20. He says, I pray that you will begin to understand what Sunday is all about, man. I, I pray that you begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help. Help who? Those who already believe in him. See, I think that so many of us stop at belief. We stop at Friday, and we don't go on to get the victory. And he goes on to say that there is some power for you. It's the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. And that's not a one-time power. That power is available for you today. It's available for your marriage. That resurrection power is available for your marriage today. That power is available for your mind today. It's available for your emotions today. It's available for your future today. It's available for your finances today. That resurrection power is available today. 
And don't take, like, I, don't take just my word for it. I know some of you are thinking, like, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to believe that. Of course it happened for you. You're the pastor. Of course you got a story of ruin to resurrection. This church is full of people who went from ruin to resurrection. I'm looking out. There's so many stories. That, like, like, and you know what? Can you help me out wherever you're at right now, Northwest Courtyard, wherever you're out in here, help, help me out real quick. Because some people, they, they, you know, they're like, you're the preacher. You're supposed to say that. If you're here today and you've experienced the resurrection power of Jesus, that you had a place in your life where you said, it's ruined. My marriage is ruined. My life is ruined. My, my future is ruined. Where It's ruined. Can you just testify? Because one thing, if I say it, but if you say it, can you stand up right now, wherever you're at, stand up and testify and give God some glory that you went from ruin to resurrection. Can you give God some glory in this place? Come on. Because it's not just available for some people. It's for all who believe in him. There is mighty power that can raise the dead. Yeah. Carl, you can, you can be seated. You can be seated, man. Because And I love this. I love seeing people. And being a, I love being a part of the journey of people bringing restoration to their life where they're going from ruin and ashes to, to beauty. In fact, that's what the ministry of Jesus is all about. That's, when you look at the Gospels, that's why Jesus came to restore those broken things back to life. In fact, there was one instance where Jesus was in the temple, and he was, as, as a rabbi, he was given the opportunity to read from one of the scrolls. And he goes and he, he grabs one of these Old Testament scrolls, and, and he opens it up in, in, in the temple, and he, and he reads from a, a, a prophecy from Isaiah. And he, and he reads it in front of everybody, he rolls it back up and puts it away, and then he sits back down and he says, today in your hearing, this prophecy is made available to you. He said, because I am alive, this prophecy that, is, that it was given Isaiah chapter 61, it's available in your life now. So here's what I want to do. I want to read you what Jesus read in Isaiah chapter 61. I want to read you that prophecy because he is alive. He's not dead. There's resurrection power. This is available. And as I read it, as we read it, um, you're going to see a spiritual progression that, that takes place. And here's my hope. My hope is that you just will go on that journey that Jesus is inviting you into because he is alive and there's resurrection power. There are some steps you're going to see as we read it. Let's look at it together. In Isaiah chapter 61, starting at verse 1, he says, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim, and here's the first step, good news to the poor. Now, he's not talking about people that don't have money, right? He's talking about people who are bankrupt in their soul. He's saying, look, you don't have to pay for your own sins anymore. I came to pay the debt for you. This, this is called the good news. We call it the gospel. This is what Friday is all about. You don't have to pay for your own sins anymore. But then he doesn't stop there. The very next thing, he says, also... He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. That now you can begin a process that every area that you're hurting, you can be healed in Jesus' name. To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness the prisoners. Jesus saying, because I'm alive, you can be free. Nothing can hold you down anymore. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, you're going to sense God's presence all over your life, changing you. And the day of vengeance for our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. But check this out. He doesn't just want to save you and heal you. He takes it another step and he says, now to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. So he doesn't just save you and heal you. He takes those broken areas and restores it to something great again. The oil of joy instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of that spirit of despair you've been carrying around on you. And the result of this, these broken things, will be restored now. He says, they, those people that used to be broken and ruined, they will be called oaks of righteousness. These people that went from ruin to resurrection, they're now pillars of their family, pillars of their church. From ashes to beauty, a planting of the Lord for, look what he says, the display of his splendor. In other words, you look at him and you go, only God could have done that. Only God, man. And he doesn't stop there. He wants to save you, heal you, restore you. And now he wants to use you. 
He says, they, those people who thought they were ruined, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew all those ruined, devastated, decaying, depressed areas. They'll renew cities that have been devastated. And I love he uses this word, devastated for generations, that they will break generational ruins and generational curses in Jesus' name. I'm just saying to you today that Easter is more than an event in history. It's an invitation to a process to restore your life from ruins to resurrection. Well, how do you do that, Pastor? I'm so glad you guys asked, man. That's so good. Thank you. There's four steps in in this process that we just read in Isaiah chapter 61 that I want to show you guys. The first is if you're still carrying around your own sin, if you're in the process of dying, which I know we're all in the process of dying, but if you're in the process of dying spiritually, I know this is profound, and it's kind of funny I wrote it this way, but here's the first thing I want you to do. Stop dying. Just, just stop dying, man. Just, just make a decision right here, right now. Why put it off that in a moment to reverse the curse, to no longer go from life to death, but from death to life? Jesus is the only one that can flip the script of your story and your life. How many of you believe that? Amen? You say, well, what's the catch, though? What's the catch, man? Jesus tells us what the catch is. Look what he says in John chapter 11. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, check this out, even though they die. They're not going that way. They're not going life to death. They're going to live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me, will never die. So their progression has been reversed. You are no longer, because you're believing in Jesus, who is the resurrection, you no longer go from life to death. He said, you're going from death to life. That's a new progression. That's resurrection power that he's giving you. And then he gives you the catch. He says it like this. Do you believe this? And there it is. That's, that's the catch. That's all it takes. You don't have to join the church. You don't have to figure stuff out. Jesus isn't even saying here, you got to change your life at this point. Just believe. And you go, well, is it really that easy? Absolutely. And to any religious people in here that are going and thinking to yourself, hold on, pastor, you're making it way too easy now. We got to put a few more steps on that thing. No, no, no. That's called religion. Okay. I can prove it to you. The best example of this is with the thief on the cross. Let me blow some of your religious theology out the window right now. For some of you that are getting your, like, your pants are getting tighter by the second, going, oh my God, pastor. Let me, let me, Luke chapter 23, this is the Friday moment. Luke chapter 23, Jesus is hanging on the cross, but he's not alone. He's got two thieves, criminals, to his right and to his left. And it says this in Luke chapter 23. One of those criminals hanging there began to shout insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. And while you're at it, save us too, you know? But the other criminal stopped him and he said, you should fear God. And then he says three profound truths that in the middle of his ruins that this criminal had a revelation. And he says three things that are still true today. Three profound things. Here's what he says. The first thing he says is all of us will die soon. And that's true today. All of us will die soon. And he says, you and I are guilty. And you and I are guilty. And we deserve to die because we're the ones who did the wrong. And you and I, we deserve to die because we're the ones who did the wrong. But this man, he says, he's done nothing wrong. And then he says this. It's so simple and so beautiful. He goes, Jesus, remember me. That's it. There was no eloquent prayer. There was no King James Version. There was just Jesus. Remember me. When you become ruling, when you start ruling as a king, remember me. And look what Jesus said to him. I promise you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Can you imagine the shock of this man, he, after he breathed his last breath moments later to show up in heaven like, whoa, what am I doing here? Like this guy, never been baptized. Yeah, never, he, he, he never said the sinner's prayer, never raised his hand in church. What is he doing there? He didn't do it. 
He never produced any fruit for the kingdom, never made any difference in anyone else's life. All we know that he was a thief, he was a criminal, he was suffering the consequences of his own actions and his punishment. There was nothing beyond that except Jesus, remember me. And he shows up in heaven. Can you imagine the shock on this dude? Like, what am I doing? I imagine, like the angel there is like, hold on, bro, what you doing? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And he's like, excuse me, I'm sorry, sir. I don't know. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know. But the only reason I do, the only thing I do know is that the man on the middle cross said I can come. Can I tell you, the only reason why you and I are going to show up in heaven one day is because the man on the middle cross said I could come. That's the result of Friday. That's the result of the cross. But don't stop there. Don't stop at Friday. Don't stop at just belief. There's resurrection power. You don't have to show up in heaven like that criminal broke, busted, and disgusted. There's more for you, which is why I, I, I want you to stop dying. And number two, write it down like this, start rebuilding. Start rebuilding that you can, buy. he binds up the brokenhearted, proclaims freedom for the captives, and release darkness from the prisoners. That there is a rebuilding process that you can start now because of resurrection power. But, but rebuilding is a process, isn't it? It's a process. One of the things I love to do, I love to hear about the transformation, the process, and what God is doing to change lives every week here at Discovery. So what I like to do is on Tuesday, we gather all our staff and our pastors and everyone together. and We, we worship together, and then we, and then we pray for all of your needs. Every needs that you guys write on those prayer cards, we just intercede. We st- and then after that, I bring them all together. And I say, okay, what did God do? Tell me the stories of what Jesus, let's brag on God. Let's give God some glory for a moment. Just because I don't hear all the stories. I hear some, but I don't hear them all. And I'm like, I want to know what Jesus did. Let's talk about Jesus for a moment. And so there's just so many stories. We tell, tell stories, we tell stories. Of all the stories that I get told, can I tell you something? Most of the time, it's connected to their community, like their small group that they're in. That why God is changing someone's life and the transformation they bring was because of the small group. Very rarely do I ever hear someone's life was changed because of the amazing messages. It only hurts, it only hurts me a little bit, right? <laughs> Just a tiny bit does it hurt. But, but honestly, I, I like it that way. I, I honestly prefer that because this place, church, was never supposed to be your life change moment. This place was always intended to be a catalyst for you to want to change, a catalyst for you to go on the journey and start the process. So here's how I like to say it, and I say it often, but I'm going to give you the challenge today. Give God one year of your life. Like give, give, give us one year of your life and just see. Go on this journey. Go on this process that Jesus is saying is made available to you because of the power of resurrection and just see what God can do with your life. And before some of you are thinking, man, a year is a... That's a long time. You've given so much of your time in life to so many other things that don't even matter. In fact, you've given your time more than that to people that you've blocked now on your phone, okay? So give Jesus one year of your life. You've given more to other things, lesser things. Give God one year of your life and just see if he does not change you. If he doesn't bring something beautiful from the ruins, something beautiful from, from the ashes. Give, I'm telling you, like write down the date somewhere. Like write it down, April 9, 2023, man, one year. And, and if this time, by this time next year, it's not gonna take that long, it isn't. But if, if by this time next year, you, you, your life isn't changed, I want you to let me know. We're gonna close these doors and go somewhere that where God is changing people's lives together, okay? Okay, because what are we doing? If it's not working, what are we doing, right? But it's not, I'm telling you, it is gonna work. Why? Because he's alive. Because he's alive. And there is resurrection power. See, the grace of God is not just available to save you. The grace of God will meet you where you are, but it will never leave you where you are. God wants to take you on a journey of rebuilding, but check it out. He doesn't stop there. God wants to take that life that is ruined, that is messed up, the marriage that is ruined, the future that is ruined, the choices that have been ruined, the past that has been ruined, and he wants to, to... save it and heal it and then turn it into something beautiful again and i meet so many people who don't believe it so i need you to stop dying start rebuilding and number three stop doubting 
Stop doubting God and what he wants to do. I want you to believe, listen to me, you can be an oak of righteousness. Yeah, you. No, no, I'm the black sheep. I'm the outcast of my family. No, no, no. You can be the pillar of your family by the resurrection power of Jesus. You can be the pillar of your church. You can be the pillar of that team. You can be the pillar of your community through the resurrection where people look at you and they go, Jason? Jason's a pastor? Are you kidding me? Him? I know you. there's not much on the south side, but, but on the east side, they're saying that over there on the east side. They're like, Jason, that dude? Which is why I planted in southwest, because they're over there saying, Jason? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. But they're like, where, where, they, go, where they go, her? She's called into ministry? What? What? Him? He's serving at church? That dude is serving at church? Oh, yeah. Only God can take something broken and make it beautiful again. See, and here's what I need you to understand, you guys. I think some of us are, are not thinking right. We don't, we don't see this. We don't see what Jesus has truly done. You, you get Friday, but you need to get Sunday. Check it out. Jesus just doesn't want to improve your life. He wants to recreate your life. You see, I think some of us, we, we see ourselves through the lens of our ruins when God has already called you a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, you guys, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. That old life, the old ruins, the old scars, the old stains, the old things you thought that you would drag around, he says, they're gone, and the new is here. See, some of you, you, you still see yourself that way. You need to stop doubting. God sees greatness in you that you don't see yourselves, and you just need to let him show you. And I would love to be a part of that process. I love to see people saved and healed and discover their purpose in Christ. I'd love the opportunity to show you what it is because when you stop dying, you start rebuilding, you stop doubting, you can do this, this last step, which is write it down like this. You can start living. You can start living. You ask, well, what is living look like it's the people who've taken their brokenness and let god make something beautiful out of it and are now being used by god to rebuild those ruins and break generational curses it is the person on our team who 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 was homeless for over 15 years and who now in their resurrected life they're serving on the homeless outreach team going out rebuilding the ancient ruins and breaking generational curses it's, it's, it's the person on our team who, who experienced abuse and neglect as a child, but now in their resurrected life is serving on our kids' team, loving on and speaking life into kids every week, living, breaking generational curses and rebuilding the ruins. It's, it's the person on our team who, who had like so much dis- depression and despair and isolation, who now by resurrection power serves on the worship team, declaring the faithfulness, the goodness, and the favor of God, rebuilding the ruins and breaking generational curses. That's, that's the power of Sunday. Ephesians 2.10 says, it is God himself who has made us what we are and given us not just better lives and improved lives, listen, new lives in Christ Jesus. And long ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. This is a big deal. I get excited about this because this is a big deal to me. Because like a lot of people, for, for, for many people, they've only heard religion. You ask people what they, what they think about church and stuff, they're like, I don't like it. They make me feel bad there. It's just, I don't feel good when I, when I go. It just feels like I'm, I'm a bad person. Here's what you need to know today. Listen, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. He came to take you from your ruins to resurrection. Amen, somebody? Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.